a relevant text when you get up to preach. I say to you all, stay awake. In honor of today's text, anyone I see sleeping, I'm going to call them out. I'm just kidding. I'm not. We are in Mark's gospel. Uh, we're in the end of chapter, reaching the end of chapter 13 today. Uh, we preach through, uh, most often here at City Church, books of the Bible, just line by line. And uh, we have been in Mark chapter 13 uh, the last couple of weeks, and then we'll finish up Mark 13 today. And then next week, we'll be making a beeline uh, straight to the cross, which is the last three chapters of Mark's gospel. And that will put us at Easter Sunday as we end our Mark series and then head into a new series after um, Easter Sunday. Um, Thank you so much for being here today, and we um, look forward to hearing what God has to say from the text. And so there was a movie that was produced in 1972. So I'd been around just a minute when this movie was released. The name of it was A Thief in the Night. And here's the, here's the plot line of the movie. The story of Patty, a young woman living for the present with little concern for the future. She meets and marries a young man, and her life seems great until one morning she awakens to find her husband gone and the radio reporting that millions of people have mysteriously disappeared. As dramatic, earth-shaking events unfold around her, Patty realizes that she is living in the end times, spoken of in biblical prophecy. Adventure and suspense build to a thought-provoking climax in this powerfully gripping film. 1972. So what that means is, This movie is grainy. Try to look it up now. It's very poor quality. Um, It has horrible acting, if we're being honest. Very cheesy visual effects and a terrible storyline. But here's what I can tell you about the movie. It's enough to frighten the life out of a preteen boy when he was exposed to a thief in the night. Has anyone else ever seen this movie? It's about the uh, rapture of Jesus. And again, it's a terrible, terribly poor made movie. Um, and I can just remember as a kid, I don't know how old I was, I was before my teenage years, uh, watching this movie and being scared out of my mind that what? Jesus is going to show up and I'm going to be left behind to build on our book from last week. And so I can tell you that this movie invoked in a young boy trying to watch this movie multiple confessions of faith, Right? And so I just wanted to make sure my name was in the Lamb's Book of Life multiple times. So every time I would read this, it, I'd be, see, find myself on my knees again, crying out to God, if somehow I've missed this and my name is not in there, can you make sure it gets written down somehow, right? So it provoked and scared the life out of enough little kids uh, to want their name in the Lamb's Book of Life many times. We said last week, There is big money to be made in end times propaganda. We see it all around us. Uh, There's YouTubers who make hundreds of thousands of dollars every year doing end times videos that we roll up into and get sucked down the wormhole of YouTube and get fed the next video after the next video while these YouTubers with their sensational headlines make hundreds of thousands of dollars based on our curiosity about the end times. There are books, there are movies, there are study Bibles designated just to the end times. There's small group material. There are more conspiracy theories than you can even count. There's more conspiracy theories about the end times than there were any political election in the history of American history. More conspiracy theories that still exist. Um, Every worldwide catastrophic event brings with it um, all these theories about how this is a fulfillment of the end times. If it's earthquakes or tsunamis or wars, whatever it may be, there's tons of conspiracy theories that go with those things that now are the end times. This is the Antichrist. Here's the great tribulation. Anybody remember the the turn of the the century in 2000, uh, the whole Y2K thing? Right? How, many, how, many, how much Y2K was affiliated with the 
end times. Uh, my, my middle daughter, Reagan, who's actually here this morning um, from college, was born um, December the 22nd, 1999. Her projected birth date was December 31st, 1999. So we lived for several months of time thinking, is Reagan going to be able to survive Why? To K. Some of you are still eating food that you saved in buckets for Y2K. Does anybody still have any Y2K supplies you're still drawing on? Some of you out there. It seems like anything that happens, right, we associate it with the end times. Uh, my dad was intrigued by the Y2K. That's a generous term. He was intrigued by the Y2K, and I felt like he was a little disappointed when the whole thing didn't happen, I have to be honest with you. <laughs> the world's not falling apart? What? <laughs> So, but we associate these things with the uh, end times, don't we? Big money to be made there, a lot of speculation. And sadly, we as followers of Jesus are often easily lured into the speculation, regardless of how many times we look at these texts and we're warned not to do it. The point of most of these texts are like, don't be lured into it. And yet we find ourselves being lured in again and again. Speculation regarding the end times goes all the way back to the time of Jesus. We've learned in Mark chapter 13. Uh, the very opening of Mark 13 is this, this, this conversation Jesus is having with the disciples where they're walking out of the Jerusalem temple, which if you were here a couple weeks ago, we put up a picture of the temple. You can go back and listen to that or watch that message. And we talked about what a magnificent building this was and how monstrous it was. And as they're leaving the temple, the disciples are like, Jesus, check out how big and awesome and wonderful this temple is. To which Jesus responded, what? This whole thing is going to be raised. Like there's not going to be a stone left on another stone, which obviously raised a lot of questions in the minds of the disciples, the what's and the when's and the how's questions. Like it was a big deal for Jesus to say this temple's coming down because it represented way more than just a building. It represented their religion, their faith, the kind of central hub of their commerce, their economy, all these things around the temple. And so for Jesus to say this whole thing is coming down, it raises a lot of questions. Later, as they sit on the Mount of Olives, which is overlooking the city of Jerusalem, Jesus gives what most scholars call the Olivet Discourse from the Mount of Olives. It's his longest and most perplexing message in all of the Gospel of Mark. And in that, he talks about, we've seen in 13, this pending destruction of Jerusalem. And he also seems to point even further ahead to the end of time. His words, as we've learned the last two weeks, they're perplexing. Um, His words are cryptic, and so for that reason, we've said again and again, we interpret texts like this with extreme caution. We enter it very carefully as we seek to understand what Jesus is saying. And I've mentioned a couple of times, I'll mention it again just quickly, things to keep in mind as you kind of look at biblical prophecy as a whole. Uh, Remember that biblical prophecy is most often not just in chronological sequence. It's not this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. As a matter of fact, most scholars believe that the things that Jesus predicted here about the end of time um, can find fulfillment in every generation since the time of Christ, that there will always be wars and rumors of wars and catastrophic events that take place. And so we have to recognize that prophecy doesn't always just happen point A, point B, point C, point D. Um, But you can think of it as, as a visual like this. Prophecy is not just one arrow pointing from what Jesus said to one event in the future. Prophecy a lot of times is many arrows. It's pointing to a event, but it also may be pointing to several events. And so we keep that in mind as we seek to understand the text. We also realize that prophecy is most often fulfilled in stages. There are things that happen in history that is a partial fulfillment of things that Jesus predicted, knowing that the complete fulfillment of that may happen at the end of time. And so there are stages of completion. We also have said in Mark 13, maybe this is the most important, that Jesus is addressing two audiences here. The first and primary audience are the disciples of Jesus and the audience to which Mark writes his gospel. 
The Word of God was always written first and foremost to an immediate audience. And so we have to keep that in mind. We have to understand the context of what's being said. Why was it said? To whom was it said? And then there's a secondary audience. That's us. We are the future audience. And so for that reason, we use a lot of caution. As we read back into the text 2,000 years later, we exercise a lot of caution and discretion. We're seeking to understand difficult and perplexing passages like this. And then I'll emphasize this one more time. Again and again and again, we have said that the the point of emphasis in prophetic passages like this is that it is calling us to focus on the who. It's calling us to focus on Jesus. It is not calling us to focus on the what and the when and the how. It's calling us to be reminded that in the end, no matter how all this kind of pans out, in the end, Jesus wins, right? You're on the winning side because you're on the side of Jesus. And so we keep that in mind, that this is about Jesus, for Jesus, and we are to keep Jesus at the center of this. Now, throughout this whole chapter, Jesus seems to be moving back and forth between kind of these looming events that happened in the next generation around 70 A.D., and then also these end times events or the second coming. And so you live kind of in this in-between stage, this things have already happened have already been fulfilled, and then there's things that have not yet been fulfilled. So there's this already and this not yet, and in between those two worlds is where we exist. We exist in the in-between, between the already and the still to come. And so our focus has to be on this season, on the in-between time. So let's jump back into the text. We'll walk through this again line by line and and then circle back for the um, kind of bring the whole chapter to a conclusion. So verse 28, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. So Jesus is using a fig tree to teach us a lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. See, so also, when you see these things, those are important words we've seen in the chapter. that Jesus uses these, this phrase, these things, which seems to refer to things that will happen in the very near future, and then he'll use the phrase, those things which seem to take place later in time. When you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gate. So it seems again that Jesus returns here to what is about to take place, the fall of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. And he uses a fig tree here as an illustration. The fig tree loses its leaves in the winter. All right, we're in this season right now. If you look around, there's not a lot of trees with leaves. Those will be coming in the next few weeks and months. Uh, But right now, most of our trees are barren because it's winter time. When we moved into our new home, um, we have a pine tree in the backyard. Yay. There's a lot of pine needles on a pine tree. My poor wife has spent just hours out there trying to rake up piles of pine straw. And it's like, what do you do with it? It's like getting it from the ground into a container is an impossible task. And so our pine tree, which still has some leaves, has a lot of residue on the ground. But we all understand this, right? We live in the south. The trees are barren. The spring is right around the corner. We see these new buds taking place. I just spent time uh, yesterday pruning our crepe myrtle tree so that hopefully in the spring and then the late summer it will be in full blossom. We do that around the church. And there's, by the way, 1.2 million videos on YouTube on how to trim trees if you're interested. And you can find whatever style of trimming you desire. You can cut that sucker all the way down to the very base if you want, or you can just cut the little tiny limbs at the top, and you can find justification on YouTube for either one, right? So all that to say, good luck figuring out how to trim your trees. But we get the point here. The leaves fall, spring is coming, The warm weather arrives and the branches grow tender with buds. And Jesus uses this metaphor to emphasize the nearness of God's kingdom. He says it's at the gates. It's near. And when you see these things, Jesus says, recognize summer is coming. We do not do anything to make summer arrive. It just happens. It just happens. The same is true with God's kingdom. Fulfillment happens in His timing not ours. And the vision that Jesus uses here is less about warning and it's more about exhortation. Summer is coming. Be ready for it. Don't be focused on the when. Be focused on the fact that it's going to happen. 
We focused on the who. Verse 30. Truly I say to you. That's always a point of emphasis when you see that word truly. Truly I say to you. Now look at the language here. This generation will not pass away until all these things, there's that phrase again that indicates immediate, these things take place. Now this this verse indicates that at least part of this prophecy will be fulfilled in the lifetime of the first disciples, the first generation who will witness right around the corner the destruction of the temple and the fall of Jerusalem. We've talked about it a couple of times, 70 AD, this Roman uh, leader Titus comes in, uh, the Jews revolt, uh, it's called the Jewish Wars, you can read all about all this in Jewish history if that's your cup of tea, and the Jewish Wars happen, a million Jews um, kind of, they, they house up in Jerusalem that they're going to protect the city and instead they get massacred. And Titus levels the city, he destroys all of Jerusalem, the temple um, is raised to the ground, and so a lot of this will take place um, in the, the next generation. And verse 31, Jesus speaks authoritatively about this. Heaven and earth will pass away, he says, but my words will not pass away. That is a remarkable claim of authority. Jesus says his words are more certain than heaven and earth itself. Now, let's let's chase this for a second in this idea. This truth rings true beyond just this one prophecy. The words of Jesus are certain. They're a guarantee. What that means for you and I is that His words can be trusted. His words are true. His words are certain. Heaven and earth will pass away before the words of Christ are not true. That's a guarantee. So those promises that we lean in and rest in, we have our doubts and insecurities and fears, we can lean into this promise that what Jesus said is true, that He will not leave you or forsake you, that He is providing His peace to you in times of comfort, that He will be there with you, that the Holy Spirit does live and reside in your heart, that these promises are unfailing because His words are certain. So what we keep in mind here is what is certain, what Jesus is saying is certain, are His words, which include that He is returning. What is uncertain is when this will take place. What is certain is he's coming again. It's guaranteed. What is uncertain is when's it going to happen? We don't know. But it's guaranteed, which is how Mark 13 ends. Let's look at it, 32. But concerning, and then here's a transition again, right? Instead of this day, Look at this language. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. So Jesus, 32, kind of marks this transition back to the end of time. Jesus says that day, that hour, and then he makes this another just confusing statement. Now think about this statement in context. The disciples are asking for a sign. They're seeking a sign. The crowds are seeking a sign for all these things. They're wanting knowledge. They're wanting details of the end times. Instead, Jesus declares the mystery of the end times exceeds, such an important word here, it exceeds not only human knowability, not only angelic knowability, But Jesus says here it exceeds the knowability of the incarnate Son of God Himself. Now let me break that down a little bit for us. You see, Jesus speaks here as what John says in his gospel, the Word who has become flesh, that the Son of God has taken on human flesh and He lives as a human on earth in full submission and obedience to the Father's will. So as a human, Jesus accepts his limitations and he lives a life of absolute trust and willful obedience to the Father. So think about the context here. The disciples are looking for signs. They're looking for indications. They're looking for timelines. They're looking for charts. But Jesus lives in absolute trust 
in the Father. He's not looking for signs. He is resting in the sovereign plan and purpose of His heavenly Father. Such an important lesson for us to learn here. In our search for signs and numbers and charts and figure it out and read this, found this, put these pieces together, in the search of that type of chaos, what we find from Jesus is not the search for signs. What we find from Jesus is absolute trust and confidence in the Father. I will trust Him. I will live in His will. 33. See how this chapter ends. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge, each with his work. Don't miss that. Each with his work. And he commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come. Right? He's coming. We do not know when he'll come. And then he lists out the four um, in the Roman calendar. These were four recognized watches through the night. Um, In the evening, at midnight, when the rooster crows, or in the morning. Lest he comes suddenly, lest the master comes suddenly and finds you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all. So Jesus is saying this to the disciples. He's saying it to every generation beyond the disciples. What I say to you, I say to all. That means he's saying it to City Church 2023. What he's saying to disciples, he says to us, what? Stay awake. Watch. Stay awake. Awake. Jesus concludes this perplexing and puzzling discourse with a call to action. Five times in these verses, with three different words, Jesus exhorts the disciples to be alert, to watch, to live with a posture of readiness. And again, he uses an illustration here, like a doorkeeper that is anticipating his master's return. We are to be alert. Notice how our watchfulness and alertness displays itself. It displays itself as we are faithful in the now. Each of the servants is instructed to do their work. Live in faithful obedience doing what I've called you to do. The master's coming. We do not know when it's going to happen. But in the process, in the meantime, in the in-between, you be faithful to do what I called you to do. Great word for all of us. Be alert. Live with this posture of readiness. So we live with a sense of awareness that displays itself in faithful obedience in the now. He is returning, and we do not know when, so stay awake, Jesus says. Don't fall asleep on the job. Literally and figuratively here, right? I'm having to deal with the situation at work of a guy that can't stay awake in meetings. Stay awake. You've got one job when we're having a meeting. Keep your eyes open. Stay awake. Awake on the job. And that's what Jesus is saying to us. Hopefully he doesn't watch this video. Stay awake. Do not grow complacent in the work that God has instructed us to do. There's a built-in promise here that we don't want to miss that we can be assured the master will return. There's no question in this story about whether the master is going to show up. The master's coming, right? That's an assumption in the story. The master will return. We do not know when, but you can be assured he is coming again. And so we live faithfully in the present with a posture of attentiveness and readiness. The entire book of Mark 13 can be summed up in this key word, watch. Like, do not get complacent. The point of Mark 13 is not so much to inform us as to encourage us, to exhort us, not to provide special knowledge regarding kind of these esoteric secrets, but to instill obedience in the followers of Jesus. By the way, these followers of Jesus, what are they about to go through? 
They are about to face intense trials and persecution. Some of them, their lives will be lost in this process. They will be martyred. They will be murdered. And in that moment, they will need to remember Jesus is coming again. And he's coming, we saw it last week, with great power and glory. And as Jesus speaks these words over the, next, of the course of the next week and months and years, things are going to get scary for these guys. Things are going to get frightening. I told you the book, of, the book of Mark is written to these followers of Jesus who are living under this tyrant, Nero, who's just burning Christians on a, on a whim, feeding them to the animals. Things are getting really scary for the followers of Jesus in the next generation. And so Jesus speaks into this, and he says, look, it is going to appear difficult at times. It's going to seem at times that evil has prevailed. It's going to look like on occasion that the enemy has won. As a matter of fact, in just a few short days, Jesus is going to hang on the cross like a criminal, and his disciples, his followers are going to look and think, did Jesus win? Has evil prevailed? Has evil triumphed? He was our king, and he's dying on the cross. He's being murdered like a vagabond on a cross. Did evil win? And so Jesus is speaking these words of encouragement to his followers who are about to watch him die. And he says to them, stay awake. Keep watch. The king who will be nailed to a cross as a criminal is coming back. Three days after he gets nailed to a cross, he's going to get up. He's coming back in the resurrection. Beyond that, at some point in the future, he's coming back again. And he's not coming as a babe, as an infant, in a manger. He is coming back in the clouds in great power and great glory. And he's going to gather his followers from every corner of the globe. So don't get discouraged. Don't think for a second that the brokenness wins. Don't allow the chaos to steal your hope because evil and sin and death do not win. Jesus wins, and he's coming back to establish his kingdom on earth. So be ready. Stop trying to figure it all out. Keep your eyes focused on the one who is returning. So let me... um. Y'all, y'all steal my time when you do that. The sermon just goes 30 seconds longer when you do that. Um, let me end the chapter, Mark 13 as a whole, with just two important words, okay? Word number one, this call to action word, watch. 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 Ironically, in our next chapter, Mark 14, Jesus instructs his followers in the Garden of Gethsemane to stay awake and watch in the garden as he prays and prepares for his crucifixion. And instead of staying awake and watching, they fall asleep. And five times Jesus reprimands them for failing to stay awake to watch. So I say to us as followers of Jesus, it is easy as a follower of Jesus to grow complacent. It is easy to grow comfortable. It is easy to grow content. It is easy to fall asleep spiritually. It is easy to just exist. It is easy to forget our call to take up our cross daily and to lose our life for His sake and for the Gospels. It is easy to grow complacent and to forget to follow. So I encourage us, be attentive, be alert, be watchful by being faithful in the now. We do not watch by getting lost in as many YouTube videos as possible. We watch by living with a posture of readiness and trust. The end is unknown and will come suddenly. So live accordingly. Not out of fear, but out of confidence that he wins. 
We don't live out of fear as the preteen boy watching the movie that scares the life out of him. He's like, I better straighten my life up, right? We live out of confidence that he is coming again, that he has done everything necessary to redeem and rescue my soul. It's like I can live with the hope and confidence. I can pay attention. I can pay attention to what Jesus has instructed us to do. Here's what we say at a city church. We continue what he started. We continue what he began. We proclaim and demonstrate the gospel. It is gospel living. Because when I understand who Jesus is, when I understand what Jesus has done, it propels me toward gospel living in this in-between time of what has already taken place and what is still to come. Jesus is coming again. We do not know when. We do not know the details. We don't know how all the signs unfold. So we do not live as alarmed. We do not live as spiritual chicken littles like we said last week. The sky is falling, the sky is falling. We do not spend our days trying to figure out the unknowable. We live as a watchman on the wall in the now doing our work, knowing that the Master is coming. We set our eyes, we fix our eyes on Jesus, and we run the race. We run with confidence and hope and assurance, knowing that He has run the race before us and he can be trusted, which is our key, a second key word in Mark 13. Trust, trust, trust him. There is a contrast in this chapter between trusting and knowing. We want to know, don't we? We want to know what it looks like. We want to know when it's going to happen. We want to know what the signs indicate. We want to know, and here's why we want to know. We want to know so that we can control it. We want to know so that we can be prepared. We want to know so that we can plan for it. But our call is not to know. Our call is to trust in the one who does know. Guess what happens when I have to trust? When I have to trust, I can't control it. When I have to trust, I can't always plan for it. When I have to trust, I can't always have it figured out. I have to trust in the one who is trustworthy. This idea of trust, and a little bit of a tweak from the idea of faith, the idea of trust is confidence in the character of who God is. Trust is confidence in the idea that based on God, who God is, He can be trusted because He is trustworthy. Here's what we learn about Jesus in the Gospels. Jesus has not revealed a God important that we can completely understand. Jesus has not revealed a God we can comprehend. He's not revealed a God that we can know fully about. Instead, he has revealed a God that we can trust. Because he is trustworthy, which enables us, here's the tweak, to live by faith, which is sight unseen. I can live by faith because I can trust in a God who is trustworthy. And faith says, I can't see it, I can't know it. I can't wrap my mind around it. I can't figure it all out with charts and questions and answers and YouTube videos. I can't see it, but I can trust that God is trustworthy. And so my faith pushes me forward to lean into Him, sight unseen, and say, I can trust you. So here's what I want you to know, follower of Jesus. You can be assured that Jesus is coming again. So in the meantime, we are people who walk by faith and not by sight. And according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, that makes us people of, here's the word he uses, people of courage. We are people of courage, walking by faith and not by sight. 
We are people of courage, not because of how awesome we are. We are people of courage because we follow a God who can be trusted. And he validated who he is by raising Jesus up after three days. So Paul says, be a person of courage. We do not retreat in fear. We live as people of courage, anticipating the day that we will be at home with our Lord, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. So live with hope. Live with courage. Jesus is coming again. So I've said it all three weeks. I might as well make it consistent. Do not walk out of these doors afraid. Afraid of the world in which you are about to be engaged. Afraid of the enemy lurking around the corner, afraid of how media is trying to influence your mind. Don't walk out of these doors afraid all the time. We are not people of fear. We are people of courage, not because we are that courageous, but because we serve a king who is in absolute control. And he is in absolute control over every situation of your life. And he can be trusted. And so we walk out of here as people of courage, courage, anticipating the day that our king will return and gather every follower from every part of the globe. And we will follow him and worship him for all eternity as people who live in courage and not in fear. You know the final words of the book? If you flip to the end, if you go to the last chapter, if you scroll down toward the end, what's the last thing that we read in all the New Testament? Final word, right? Final words are important. The final words in the final book, in the book, some of the final words is this plea. Jesus, come, come, come again, come again. And here's the invitation at the end of the book. Everyone who is thirsty, if you're thirsty, if you're spiritually thirsty, if you are thirsty for purpose and meaning, if you are thirsty for life, if you are thirsty for hope and confidence, if you're thirsty for knowing God and understanding God, if you're thirsty, at the end of the book, guess what it says? Come, come, come those who are thirsty. Come because he's coming again. We come because he's coming. And John the Revelator wrote the book of Revelation in all of its perplexity and all of its confusion. He's pretty clear in the end, isn't he? When he says it all at the end, he says, even so, Jesus, Jesus, come, come quickly, come quickly. And that's our heart's cry. We are people of courage who live a life anticipating the return of our king, knowing that in the meantime we live in between the already and the not yet as people who are called to a task to continue what Jesus has done, and we do so with the confidence and courage that we are on the winning side because Jesus is the king of kings. Let's bow our heads for prayer.